The Spell of the Sorcerer's Skull, Chapter 10 The chapel was gone. In its place stood a dignified old Victorian mansion with a mansard roof and deep-set attic windows. The ground floor windows were long and heavy, and had heavy drapes on the inside. The drapes reached all the way to the floor, and they had been pulled tight so no glimmer of light could be seen. Over the front door was a fanlight, and flanking the stout oak portal were two flat pil pilasters with scrolled capitals on top. At Johnny's feet lay a semicircular slab of stone that served as a front stoop for the house, and on the stone lay little wandering white trails of snow. Johnny gasped. He staggered back, awestruck, and he saw off to the left a light shining. In a dreamlike trance, trembling and holding his breath, he moved around the corner of the house toward the lighted window, and then he got his second shock. He found that he was peering in at a horribly familiar room. It was the dollhouse room, the one he had seen in his midnight vision at the Fitzwilliam Inn. There was the fireplace, the red oriental rug, the built-in bookshelves, the table with the oil lamp and the Bible on it, everything. And in the black leather chair sat Professor Childermass. He was still dressed in his ragged, shabby clothes, and he appeared to be asleep. His hands were folded in his lap. Johnny could see his chest moving in and out as he breathed. Icy terror gripped Johnny's heart. This was the death room. Without being told, he somehow knew that a dark shape would soon appear in the doorway off to the right. The unearthly thing that had snuffed out Lucius Childermass's life would be returning, and it would put its hand over the professor's face and... No! No! yelled Johnny, and he rushed to the window. With all his might, he banged and slammed on the glass. He pounded with his fists till his hands stung. But he might as well have been, pounding, have been pounding on sheet metal for all the good it did. The professor slept on, and the firelight flickered over the red carpet, and the pendulum on the mantel clock wagged. Johnny stumbled back, eyes goggling. Then a blind panic seized him, and he turned and ran. He was at the bottom of the hill before he knew it, shoving his way through the creaking turnstile. On over the dark, rainy field he ran, limping badly. He never knew afterward how he managed to make it down to the shore, but he did, and only when he had stopped running did he gasp because of the unbelievably fiery stinging. Madly, Johnny looked around. There was the boat, rain pelted down on the tarpaulin that had been thrown over the food and the other, th and other, and the other things. Nearby, under a tree that grew close to the shore, lay Father Higgins. As Johnny moved nearer, flashlight dangling from his limp hand, he saw a heavy tree limb that lay near the priest's inert body. Father Higgins didn't move a muscle. Was he dead? Johnny stumbled closer and dropped to his knees. He played the beam of the flashlight on Father Higgins' head, and he saw a clotted, sticky mass of blood on his hair. in his hair. Oh, please, no! Johnny prayed desperately. Please, not this, not this, not this! Father Higgins groaned. He opened his eyes and stared blearily at Johnny. We're surrounded! He mumbled thickly. Pin down! Rifle fire! Can't get out! Gotta take out those mortars! Got any grenades left? Here, let me try. If Johnny had been able to break down and cry, he would have. But, as it was, he just felt numb. Father Higgins' mind was wandering back to the island of Guam during the Second World War. Johnny put his hands over his face. What do I do now? He muttered through his fingers. They were all going to be killed here on this tiny hunk of rock and sand. People would find their bodies weeks from now and wonder what had happened. Johnny wanted to give up. He wanted to throw his body down on the sand beside Father Higgins and just wait for the end. But with a violent effort, he shook off despair. He was still alive, and he was not going to give up. Johnny dragged himself to his feet. He tried to force his watery brain to think calmly. Where was Fergie? He had come down to find Father Higgins, but apparently he had not made it. But what? A twig snapped. Bushes rustled. Turning suddenly, Johnny peered off into the dark mass of bushes that loomed nearby, right at the edge of the beach. By straining his eyes, he could just make out a shadowy human shape. Fergie! Johnny called in a faltering voice. Hey! Fergie! Is... Is that you? More crackling and snapping. The shape shuffled closer. Johnny felt a deathly chill, and the hairs on the back of his neck stood up. He had a sudden vision of the scarecrow thing that he had seen on the ferry boat. In a flash, Johnny plunged his hand under his shirt and gripped the silver crucifix. The shape halted. It hovered menacingly for a second or two, and then it melted back into the dark bushes. The chill passed away, and Johnny somehow knew that the thing was gone for the time being. 
Now what was he going to do? Johnny didn't know. He lifted the crucifix's chain off his neck and played the flashlight's pallid beam over this odd magical object. At the place where the arms of the crucifix crossed was a tiny dome of glass, and under it were two holy splinters. This blessed talisman could ward off evil, but it couldn't help him rescue the professor. No, something else was needed for that. But what? Johnny wished that he was a sorcerer, with reams of powerful curses and incantations rolling around in his head. A great wizard like Albertus Magnus or Count Cogliostro would be able to fight, to fight magic with magic, but he was just John Michael Dixon of 23 Fillmore Street in Dunstan Heights, Massachusetts. What could... And then a very odd, unlikely thought came floating into his mind. Father Higgins had told him once that some of the Latin phrases in the Mass were thought to have magical powers. Johnny was an altar boy, and he knew a lot, a lot of church Latin by heart. But there was a better source than his poor befoggled brain. He would use Father Higgins' breviary. The little prayer book that he carried in his coat pocket. The breviary was full of prayers, some in English and some in Latin, and one of them just might do the trick for him. Once again, Johnny knelt down. He took off his rain-soaked jacket and folded it up to make a pillow for Father Higgins' head. Then he fumbled in the right-hand pocket of the priest's clerical jacket. Nothing there but loose change. With a sinking heart, Johnny tried the other pocket, and his hand closed over a small book. This was it. He had found it. Johnny stood up, and limping badly, he began to make his way back toward the graveyard. But he had only taken a few steps when he stopped. An awful thought had come to him. What if the scarecrow thing, or whatever it, had, it was that had been hovering nearby, what if it came to get Father Higgins? Maybe it had been about to pounce on him when Johnny arrived. What if the blessed book, the breviary, had been the only thing that kept Father Higgins safe? He couldn't just leave him here with no protection at all. Reluctantly, Johnny turned back. He reached into his pocket and pulled out the crucifix and chain. Kneeling, he gently slid the chain over the priest's neck. Once again, Johnny shone his flashlight beam at Father Higgins' face. His eyes were closed, and he was mumbling something that Johnny couldn't make out. Johnny didn't want to leave him, but he had to. Muttering a prayer, he pulled himself to his feet and set out again. The rain was stopping, and the clouds, driven by a strong wind, were breaking up. Johnny saw a vague silver glow overhead, which meant the moon was trying to break through. It was easier to see now, and he forced himself to plod on over the bumpy field and up the little hill to the cemetery. He felt very jittery without the crucifix hanging around his neck. It was true that the breviary had been blessed, at least Johnny hoped that it had. Father Higgins had told him once that all the sacred implements used by a priest, his mass vestments, the chalice, and so on, had been blessed by a bishop. But would a blessed book save him? Johnny was in tears now. He was feeling sorry for the professor, for Father Higgins, for Fergie, for himself, through the creaking turnstile. And up to the cemetery road he stomped. Wearily he looked up and saw the dark, unreal house still looming against the sky. Sniffling, Johnny came to a halt and put the flashlight under his armpit. Holding the book rigidly in both hands, he began loudly to chant. To chant. He began to chant loudly. Judea came, Deus et discerne, Casam, Miam, Digenti, Nam Sancta, Ahamo, Inequo, et Deloso, Erume. If he expected the house to disappear, he was disappointed. It was still there. This is crazy, thought Johnny. Absolutely crazy. He